right, hello everyone. So I'll say a few things about the exam in just a couple minutes. I'm going to let people log in. Um, I can tell right now we have zero viewers. That'll probably jump up to 15 or 20 in just a few minutes. So I'm going to hold off on that for just a couple minutes um, while people come in. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to come back to granular filtration and start working on um, how exactly to model and understand on a mathematical level how much water we're getting out of granular filtration units. So just kind of as a reminder uh, where we left off last time, um, so far in the class looking at a typical schematic for a water treatment facility, we've gone through sedimentation, flocculation, coagulation, and again sedimentation um, is often used after that as well. And now we're on to filtration. So this is the second to the last step um, in a way. We typically, you know, a typical system will do each of these steps, then have this filtration to really get out any last particles, maybe help um, with some adsorption of chemicals as well, uh, then disinfect and send to the distribution system, which are kind of, kind of, um, similar processes there. The distribution system actually acts as a chlorine contactor in a way as well. So we want to make sure that when we are disinfecting, and we'll talk about this uh, probably next time, that we have enough residual chlorine and the right type to keep the distribution system clean, keep bacteria and everything from uh, repairing themselves and growing back. Okay, so this is what we'll be talking about today again is the Granular filtration, we can also use membrane filtration. So actually, membrane filtration is what we'll be talking about in the very next lecture. Um, once we're done with filtration, both types, then we'll go on to disinfection. Okay, so most people are here now. Um, so about the exam, um, my opinion of it was it was a little bit too long and challenging, primarily because I made a mistake on, I think it was the second part of the second question, was technically impossible. Um, I asked you to give me a, a first order, or excuse me, a, a, a rate constant, a zero order rate constant, and it turns out that, um, so it, it was the, the deal with a swimming pool with evaporation. So if you had evaporation, the, the volume was changing at a zero order rate, and that was okay. So the part A and C were fine of that problem, but part B, probably a lot of you got held up. I, I apologize, that, that was my bad. So my, what I'm going to tell you is I understand that probably slowed you all down quite a bit um, for the exam. I feel bad about that. At this point, there's nothing I can do except to tell you that I'm not going to count that against you um, for sure. So I'm not going to count that, pro that part of the problem. Um, basically, I'll just give everyone full credit for that part of the problem. Um, if I decide that it's uh, to do something else, I might give bonus points if you did get a good approximation to what, you know, a reasonable estimation of uh, an answer if you were to simulate it as a, as a uh, zero order problem. Um, but I'll, I have, I need to look at the exams first uh, to make a call about that. Um, otherwise, aside from that, that issue, I thought it was about right. So if I just hadn't included that, I think I probably would have been happy with it overall. I, I know it was kind of challenging, but hopefully not too bad aside from that that issue. So that's kind of what I wanted to say there. Um, I'll, I'll do my best to make it as fair as possible, given, the, given that. Um, and I'm always open to feedback if you, uh, if you have a particular concern um, or issue. But we can talk about that more, and we will talk about that more um, when, when I have graded the exams and I pass them back. Um, I'll spend most or all of the lecture kind of working through those problems with you, making sure there's no questions, making sure you understand the content. Um, I like to do that especially because this content really builds on itself. So as you, as you master what we covered there, you'll have a better working knowledge for the next steps. Okay. So coming back then, uh, so that's the announcement about that. Um, coming back then to filtration, like I said, we are most of the way through the typical treatment train for a drinking water treatment plant. Uh, last time we talked about kind of the, 
the basics of granular filtration, the uh, kind of qualitative information using um, well-controlled grain size. So this media up here would be the, the actual filter media and that would, you'd have a lot of that, more than this drawing is showing or this uh, picture. And then you'd probably have some thicker stuff at the base just to um, prevent these smaller grains from escaping uh, through whatever great um, mesh you have there. Um, and these, this would be uh, hauled in or craned in uh, by the ton and filling up these very large uh, filtration beds. So if you ever had to replace the media, that's, that's actually a pretty uh, substantial mass of media that you'd have to work with. And we might, we might take a look at some problems sometimes just on the, the amount of media required. It would be a, a very straightforward um, you know, algebraic, algebraic problem. Uh, units problem. Okay, and these, these filtration beds are typically quite large. Um, it doesn't really matter the, uh, the geometry here, but they're often rectangular. Um, from this picture, I'm not actually clear whether or not it's like this, this one large rectangle or maybe that's broken off into squares. Uh, but either case, that would be, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be out of the ordinary. Uh, there's also a chance I'm misreading it as well, and we actually have the beds going this way with a walkway over them. Um, whatever the case, uh, these typically occupy a fairly large amount of space. Uh, they're typically, you have a couple media meters of media and then a space for a couple meters of water on top of that media to pressurize it. So these are typically, you know, something like four or five meters deep altogether, all told. Um, so that's a pretty substantial drop if it was empty. Okay, so just a last little bit of recap from last time. Uh, we talked about kind of the filtration cycle, uh, the importance of backwashing, and really the challenge for us is going to be com to combine our, um, our knowledge about when, when we need to backwash it, how often and how much time and stuff like that we need to, to spend backwashing and rinsing and all of that in order to come up with some average flow that a filter can produce. So we talked about uh, when we stop it and further, okay, what does an actual filtration cycle look like where we have mostly, most of the time is production, which is what we want. And then eventually we stop it and maybe we air purge, maybe we don't, and we backwash and then we have to rinse. Um, now importantly, the, the backwash and the rinse, we have to do that with clean water so that we, we make sure we're not recontaminating our, our system. And so when we take clean water, it's basically subtracting from what we produced before. Okay, so that's kind of the, the key, key point there and we're gonna get into the math of that uh, next. Okay, so as we think about our, the amount of water we're producing, the first parameter that we, we wanna look at is the loading rate. And what I mean by loading rate is how much water are we adding to the filter at any given time, or actually not at any given time, during the production time. So if we have our filter and it's full of some media, what we're looking at is how much water are we adding to that over time. So we've got some flow coming in, and we can put this as a flow rate, but we're not actually gonna use a flow rate for for most of our analysis because it actually makes more sense to divide that flow rate by the surface area of the filter. Okay, so we've got some amount of water coming in, goes through, gets the filtration, and leaves. So instead of going strictly by the flow rate, what we wanna do is use Q over the area of the filter because that gives us kind of the uh, a, a value that we know, okay, irregardless of the size of the filter, how much water can we pass through the filter safely? So we're not, um, you know, it's sort of like the velocity water passing through the filter so that we're not um, causing any problems with the filter itself. So that's the equation here that we're gonna be deriving. So a typical production rate would be expressed something like five to 25 cubic meters per square meter per second. So 
we take that flow rate of cubic meters per second and divide it by that that surface area and this is the type of number we get you could also express that you know, 2 to 10 gallons per minute per square foot so really this is um, something we would call a flux and we'll refer to it as flux when we're talking about membranes um, So a flux is some amount of something passing through a plane, right? So that in terms of our um, kind of our physics here, we've seen this before in other systems. We'll see this pretty much the exact same concept in our membrane filtration, except there's going to be some difference um, differences in the way we work with the systems. Okay, so our loading rate then is the rate at which we're loading water onto the filter in meters per second. It's not the flow rate. So I'm going to say this, this Q is not equal to VA. Instead, the Q is going to be equal to VA times the area of the filter. Uh, so, or alternatively, you could say that VA, that loading rate, so I'm defining this loading rate here as, you could also call it production rate, as V with a lowercase a, a subscript. That's how the book is terming it, so that's why I'm using this. Um, so we've got this term, uh, and it's a lowercase v. So lowercase v subscript a, our loading rate, is equal to the volume of water going through per time. So that's where our Q is coming from, also divided by that area. So overall, Q over the area. So this will give us. Uh, if we're working with meters, we could have it in meters per second, or we could have it, as shown just above, with cubic meters per square meter per second. Of course, you can change this to be centimeters, minutes, whatever. But these units here are representative of what we would normally use, um, and it's essentially distance per time. So that's the distance, that's the, the speed at which water is traveling through this filter. So if we know that, and then we say, well, we're going to double the filtration area by adding more filters, then we can know, okay, we, we're not looking at the flow itself, we're looking at just, we know what, what rate we can load these things, so then we can calculate the flow rate um, that we, we can adjust to. Okay, so that's a little more complicated than it needed to be, I think, but the point is, it's the amount of water we're putting on the filter or putting through the filter. All right. Um, one thing I'll, I'll make a note of, uh, a couple things here. This loading rate applies to the production portion of our system only. So I guess I'll go back to red here for a second. Um, this loading rate happens during production. We're going to use the same loading rate during the rinsing because we want to rinse it and kind of prime it at the same speed that we're doing everything else. Um, the backflush, backwash or backflush sometimes will increase the speed, give it a little more uh, action, turbulence, things like that. Um, some, if not, then we'll just leave it as the loading rate. We'll, we'll get into more of that in a moment. Um, but for now, this VA is applied primarily here um, and also, this is also used here. I'm making a distinction here because we're going to need to calculate the volume of water we produce in this production time um, different or separately than the volume of water that we use for the ripening stage and, and the backwash. For now, I'll, I'll say VB over here for the, the backwash loading rate. Okay, so I was talking about this in a roundabout way, but if we have some flow rate that the plant needs to demand, uh, needs to supply. We have a filtration plant or a uh, treatment plant, and it needs to provide, let's say, one million gallons per day of water to a community. Well, the flow that one filter is going to handle is certainly not going to be equal to that that entire um, plant's flow. So when we're talking about the flow rates, um, it's useful to say, okay, well, we can calculate a flow rate for one filter, but just keep in mind that's going to be different than the Q total or the Q for the entire plant. You have a question? Uh, the 20 for the rinse, is that in hours or minutes? Um, 
So here, this would be 20 minutes. Uh, the question was this 20 here, is this hours or minutes? So rinse, that's going to be, typically that'll be like 20 minutes, yeah. Okay, so with this, uh, we have some information about really just, this is kind of giving us the tools to, to know how much water we produce given some amount of um, filter area. So an another thing we want to know is the efficiency of a filter uh, given the amount of water it can produce and compare that to the amount of water wasted. Um, so the filter efficiency we're going to define as how efficient is it on a water basis? So how much of the water that it produces in a cycle actually ends up usable and not wasted? Okay, so that's why we're gonna have this, um, the symbol nu is our filter efficiency. And we're gonna say this is equal to the volume that we produce during filtration. So VF being, so uppercase V, um, subscript F, that's the volume of water filtered or produced that's, that's happening during this production stage. VF, um, that's produced in this portion of the cycle, right? So that's where that, that section's coming from. And on that basis, so that's our denominator, how much do we have left after we account for the volume we used in backwashing? So this was our backwash section. So we're going to spend some amount of time taking clean water, running it backwards through the system. And we're going to take some water, some clean water, um, and run that forward through the system after we do the backwash. Um, and remember, here I'm saying the cycle ends at the backwash and starts at the rinse. You could technically arrange this so that the, you start right at the filtration and then you do a rinse after the backwash on this end. It doesn't really matter. It's, it's the same effect. Um, and you just repeat over and over again. Okay, so that gives us this value that's going to be a ratio of the amount, the water, we'll say the water here, water remaining or uh, usable, divided by the water um, produced. Okay, so on an efficiency basis, we're looking at um, you know, if, if we have an intake of 5 million gallons per day in our drinking water plant intake, that's how much water we're drawing in from a, a lake, a river, stream, wherever, um, how much of that can actually become useful water? Well, this is, this is part of that efficiency calculation because we're going to lose some of it by backwashing and rinsing. Okay, so that's what this parameter is for to give us an idea of that water-based efficiency. Um, so these are all the volumes. And how do we calculate these volumes? It's actually uh, very straightforward and very intuitive. But m make sure you remember this for the exams and things. that I don't give this to you on the uh, equation sheet. I will post a new equation sheet um, hopefully tonight uh, when I think about it. Um, so you can start preparing for the next exam looking at that. Um, but essentially, it's it's a unit analysis, right? We, we talked about this. Again, it's... Um, very straightforward once you see it. I'm just trying to be very clear about it. The volume produced is going to be that loading rate, so the, the speed at which it's going through over time, multiplied by time, multiplied by the area. Okay, so this is um, just taking the area of a filter times the loading rate that's being applied to the filter times the time, that filtration time, right? So this, if we're looking at a timeline, this would be TF. Here we would have T for an air purge if we're doing it, T for the backwash, and T for the rinse. Um, we're not using or producing any water here, so this would this volume spent for air would be zero if we're doing a volume analysis. Okay, so, and just, just to take a look at these units, this is meters squared times meters per second times second. That gives us cubic meters as a volume. Okay, hopefully pretty straightforward there. This is kind of just converting. You take a flux, multiply it by um, by the area through which you're, um, you're sending that flux, 
that gives you a flow rate and you multiply by time to go from a flow rate to a, a volume. Okay, now the, the only caveat here is this uh, VB could be different. Sometimes it's the same. Um, let me highlight it so I don't... I'm trying not to cover the B, but still give it a highlight. So let me just do this. Of course, it's not going to let me. So what I want to say here is that um, sometimes VB can equal VA or uh, typically up to two times VA. Okay, so this basically just saying in terms of the speed at which we backwash, um, of course we're going to use more water if we're backwashing at a faster rate. Um, but we might change this depending on the filter and uh, its operation. Some operators will, will go up to about two times uh, the loading rate. If I don't give you this on a problem, just assume they're the same. So VA equals VB. If you're in doubt, you can, you can write your assumption. Um, or I'll probably tell you somewhere in the prompt that it's, you know, the VB is twice the VA um, or like it's backwashed at twice the loading rate, something like that. Um, so that should give you, tip you off to the uh, information you need, um, but it's also fine to assume if you, if it is unclear, just write your assumption clearly, um, and that, that'll be okay. All right. So from there, that's kind of our, our volume analysis. Uh, the other portion would be, um, so we've, we've done a f filtration efficiency. Uh, how efficient are we on a water basis? Uh, we also need to know the net water we can produce. So instead of just a kind of an efficiency basis, we can take a look at the net loading rate. So we're going to modify VA to be like a, a VA prime sort of thing where we have over the whole cycle time, what kind of a loading rate do we get? And we're going to call that effective loading rate REF. So lowercase r. Uh, subscript EF for effective. Again, this is the book's terminology. That's why I'm, I'm following it. And so this is going to be exactly the same as the loading rate in terms of units, you know, meters per second or cubic meters per square meter per second, something like that. Um, but this time it's not it's not something we can directly measure based on how quickly the water is going through the filter because the actual loading rate um, is something you literally in the plant you're sitting there watching the water go through you're adjusting the pipes or whatever the the nozzles the flow rates to achieve that speed um, or to allow that speed here we're looking at a kind of a conceptual thing in terms of on average what's happening in the system so this effective loading rate really is taking a look at through a given area. So in the numerator here, we have area in the filter on each of the uh, denominators for this entire numerator term. Um, that'll simplify, we'll see in a moment. But through that area, how much water is going through? Um, and then we're going to take that and divide it by the total amount of time in the cycle. So uh, that turns out to give us really a volume per area per time. Just like we were talking about with the VA, we said the A was equal to um, volume per time per area of the filter. Uh, and in this case, that was the volume filtered. This time we, you know, we're taking that same sort of a, an approach, but normalizing it instead of by the time of filtration, the TF. Um, instead of that, we're doing all of the times combined, and we're subtracting the amount that we used, um, the amount, of, the volumes that we used for backwashing and rinsing. So uh, this is kind of similar to the approach we just saw for the efficiency, but here we're we're dealing with a 
total cycle time basis instead of just a, on a water basis. This will this is going to be a little bit different because we have um, potentially some time during the air purge where we don't have any water production or loss. Okay, so this is we cannot make a direct um, comparison. We would be tempted to say that um, that REF is equal to this filter efficiency, which, by the way, this this is a fraction, right? That's going to be, uh, if we go back to look at it, a volume per volume, that's going to give us a ratio, right? The ratio, like 0.96 or something, if it was 96% efficient. Um, so if nu equals 0.96, then that's 96% efficient. So that's that's you know how we use our new value. So if, if we would take that and multiply it by VA, we'd be tempted to say that because you know oh it's how efficient is the filter? We can multiply that here and get the effective. It's not quite right. It's close, um, and you can do that to double check that you're close, but it's not actually the same because uh, primarily because of this time you spend doing air and just the way that the time is factored in instead of just water. It, it would also throw things off if you were backwashing at a different loading rate and you know some other things. But it's, it's not the same. There are, might be systems where you could use that um, at least as an approxima approximation, but it, that's uh, not the case. So don't go that route to solve problems. Um, maybe if you feel adventurous, use that to double check that you're in, in the right ballpark. Okay, so then we have this, uh, this loading rate where we have the total cycle time. So all of these together, this is going to be our, our time for the cycle. So that's going to be all the times added here. And what, again, what we're dealing with is this volume filtered. Um, we've got nothing happening during the air purge, but we do have that time dedicated to it. We've got the volume for backwash and the time for that and the volume rinsed and the time for that. Okay, so and again um, this volume that we're using, uh, the backwash or any of them, any of them really, uh, it's going to look like this, right? We have to, to get that volume produced, it's volume, excuse me, the area of the filter times the backflush loading rate in this case times the, the time for the backwash. And that'll give us, you know, that's taking this specific instance and looking at, you know, how much volume we're getting. Okay, so I've got a question here. Will the loading rate formula need to be memorized? No, I'm going to give you, and uh, it's a very good question, I'm going to give you this equation, actually I'm going to highlight it in a different color for you. I'm going to give you that one and the filter efficiency um, equation. So it should be in that form and, as well as this one. So I'm, I'm spending some time on it to make sure that you understand what, what's happening with it um, for these, but I will give you these two equations on the exams. They should be relatively intuitive um, and I'm hoping hoping to get you to that point where they are pretty intuitive um, because the the granular filtration in particular it's really a lot of just unit analysis and making sure you have a good grasp of what the cycle is doing and what we're actually trying to calculate um, so otherwise it's it's not super complicated material um, for this section okay uh, any questions on how this is working before we take a look at a problem I think it, this this topic in particular, I think, will make more sense as we start looking at uh, some problems, seeing what we might actually be trying to solve for, um, how and how to use uh, these pieces. So, for the efficiency, you're saying the usable water is the uh, VF minus the backwash volume minus the uh, rinsing volume. Yeah. So the question is for the filter efficiency, the usable water, um, is it the volume filtered minus the, the backwash minus the rinse. Yes, I, I agree that's a good way to say it. 
Um, and the reason is because we take clean water, so we, we filter a bunch of water, let's say we spend 36 hours and during production, filter all this water, we have a huge volume of water, and we, I mean, it's, it's being sent out, but we're producing a huge volume of water. And once we take one filter down to backwash it and to clean it, because this is, they're gonna go on a cycle, right? You've got 10 filters, one or two are down at any given time to clean while the others are producing and, and running nicely. So this is gonna be like pretty much always one down for maintenance and, and the others running. So, or, you know, some, some cycle like that. So um, the usable water then is we're producing all this water, but continuously we have to recycle some of it back. And what we what we do with that water, it doesn't go through to our clean stream. It has to be through to a waste stream. And so we're taking that water that was going to be clean produced water, and we're subtracting that by sending it down to wastewater uh, line because we've put a lot of particles into it. And we don't want to... Theoretically, you could say, well, we're filtering it again anyway, right? So we could maybe just do it again and never do that. But you're just going to have a huge accumulation of these particles. You know, you saw in the, the videos that it was just a thick, brown, almost black slurry with all these particles coming back out. So we want to take those and separate them to a landfill um, through a, a dedicated wastewater treatment um, setup. So that that's kind of... Uh, the reason that those two volumes here are going to kind of count against our usable water. So the filter is like the total volume. Yeah, so the uh, question is the filter is like the total volume. Yeah, this VF here, this is the total volume that we are we have to work with um, in terms of clean water. We, we have to backwash and rinse with clean water um, or we want to because we don't want to load up our our um, filter with dirty water from whatever stream river we're, we're taking from um, so and we're certainly not going to use use that backwash water again so this VF is going to be really what what we're able to work with for the rest of the processes um, so every time we we take from you know we we spend some of our water backwashing that's sort of eating away at our VF that we use, that we uh, produce total. Now, again, the, the v, VF is usually, or the TF, let's say, is usually in hours, you know, maybe up to 96 hours, 100 hours, something like that at, for some cases, whereas these, the rinsing time and the backwash time, those are minutes. So it really is a small portion if we're looking at it kind of a this linear scale. It might just be that amount of water there um, compared to all that much we've produced. But since we're doing it continuously, we always have to take a filter down to be cleaning, something like that. Um, it's, it's vital that we, we don't estimate our plant's ability to produce water based on just the VF. Okay, so feel free to ask more questions as we go. Um, here's a problem to get us going. Uh, this is one of the problems in, the, in our chapter, and this is going to be on um, so it's problem 6.9 on page 360. We have a conventional water treatment plant that's treating 2.4 cubic meters per second of river water. The filters in the plant are 8 by 8 meters surface area. They operate on the following schedule. The filter is cleaned once in each 24 hour period. The backwash rate is 10 liters per square meter per second for a period of 8 minutes. It takes an additional eight minutes to drain the filter, break up the media with air injection, uh, <clears throat> and break up the, air, the media with air injection. The total filter cycle time is 24 hours. Uh, 15 minutes is used for rinsing the filter after backwashing. During production, the water is applied to the filter at a rate of five and a half liters per square meter per second. So the question then is, what is the filter efficiency? Okay, so. It, just real quick here, we do see we have liters. We may need to convert that to uh, cubic meters. Um, so keep that in mind. We have we have that as a loading rate, and we are we have cubic meters per second as a a total flow rate for the plant. Um, okay, so part A is asking us first, what is our filter efficiency? 
This is going to be our new. And part B is going to ask, uh, what is the minimum number of filters required by the plant? OK, so I'm going to go ahead and give you a, a couple moments to start setting up the problem. It might help you to draw a cycle time and just label, um, label the portions. Certainly not necessary, but it might help you uh, get a feel for what's going on in the problem. Um, so I'll give you a couple minutes, and then I'll, I'll work with you through part A, give you a couple more minutes for part B on the next slide, um, and happy to answer any questions along the way. Okay, so there was a question here about uh, the air purge step. Um, it, so uh, asking if, if there is no air purge. Um, as we take a look, it says um, takes an additional eight minutes to drain the filter and break up the media with air injection. So this eight minutes to drain, so I didn't mention this, but just simply letting the water drain out we kind of saw that in one of the video clips I showed you. Combined with the amount of time they're pushing air through, you could just lump that all that into the kind of an air purge step. Um,
Yeah, so what I did with the point zero 0.01, actually, I, I uh, let's see, did I do that right? Yeah, okay, it does say, yeah. So that's coming from the uh, 10, the yeah, question was the, I just want yeah. to make sure it was VB. Yeah, yeah, that's VB here. Yeah, yeah I just converted it straight to uh, meters instead of liters. So mostly I'm just writing up stuff we already know here. Um, I'm going to continue to do so for a moment and start solving for the different volumes. Um, and I, for now, I guess just uh, take a look. Feel free to start working on part B um, and just check al along as we go. Um, and I'll, I'll explain once I'm done. So far, I just did the uh, VF calculation for the volume. We had to figure out the time of the filtration. We knew the cycle time was 24 hours, and we had 8 minutes of this, 8 minutes of that, 15 minutes of rinse. Uh, so it was really 31 minutes less than 24 hours for the remaining time for filtration. And some conversions there I, I skipped on the slide here. But essentially, we convert to seconds because that's going to be convenient. and. Uh, then plug that in here. I'm going to do the same thing for volume backwashed. We're using a different loading rate and just using the eight minutes. So this will come out to 307.2 cubic meters. Sorry, that should be cubic there. Oops. And the volume for the rinse. It's pretty close. We can expect it's not going to be too far off the backwash. It was twice the, uh, about twice the time, the 15 minutes instead of eight, um, and about half the, um, the rate because we're using the normal loading rate for the rinse water. So that should give us um, 
give us a, about the same or something pretty close just by thinking about it. And if you do the calculation, sure enough, it's 316.8 uh, cubic meters. OK, so we have those three volumes then. That's really all we need to solve for our filter efficiency. Um, it's going to be this 29,000 minus the 300 minus 300. So when we do that, we should end up with a value of uh, 0 0.979. So really, it's about 98% efficient, um, just under. Yeah, so there's a good question about rounding, how you, how I want you to round. So, um, and, and if you were to have rounded from, you said 29,000, just 700? Mm -hmm. Or? Just like what you have there, if you uh -huh. calculate that, you would get 98.8. But if you just, if you round it up, like you usually get 29,758. And that's how you got 97.9. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying, like this is. Um, and yeah. you're saying that made a, yeah, how much of a difference? That, when I rounded the, the last digit there? Yeah. I don't think that should make that big of a difference in the calculation. Yeah, so do, double check the calculation because, I mean, but it's a good question about rounding in general. So what what I try to do, and I, I may not have shown that very well here, but for rounding in general, what I, what I try to do is stick with either standard significant figures, which you might remember from chemistry. Um, it's really about, you know, using the, um, the level of detail you're given um, it doesn't always make sense with some of these book problems, like the, the 8.0, that gives us two significant figures, but the eight minutes, eh, you could say that's just one, but at the same time you could say you can measure time pretty accurately. Um, it gives three significant figures here. So at the end, the very end result, it's okay to give me just two significant figures because that's there, but during the calculations up to that point, what you want to do is carry... Um, carry all of the detail with it. So if I'm solving this in Excel or on a calculator, I would take the previous answer. Even if I shorthand it out here and round a little bit, I would carry that through in my calculator. Um, if I see that something, a small difference like that happened on an exam or something, I'll pretty much give you full credit. I'm not going to be a stick, stickler about it, even though, you know, I guess I could. Um, so did, did you try it again? Yeah, on the, I, I don't know why. Okay, so it was probably something just a, a miss a misstep to the, made that big of a difference but but yeah it was, it was good to let you know kind of my thoughts on that so uh, yeah and if I was really being careful about significant figures here it, it would just be 0 0.980 because our our area was given with two um, even though some of the other info was given with three significant figures but anyway okay good question uh, any other questions about this problem Part A. Okay, so we'll go on to part B. I uh, kind of squished the figure in case we needed more room. Don't think we need to, but um, here we have uh, what is the minimum number of filters required by the plant. So we don't have a specific term for number of filters, so I'll just draw it that way. Um, so this is going to take into account our total flow rate. So we need a Q total. And whenever we're kind of doing this type of a problem, we didn't we didn't specifically learn something to to deal with Q total, um, so it's going to be intuitive, right? We have some total amount of flow we need to meet, uh, and the question would be then, how do we decide how many filters we need? Well, you know, there's you could potentially go on filter efficiency, but I don't think that's going to quite cover it. I think we need to look at the um, the effective loading rate so that we know that the effective loading rate multiplied by, because um, that, again, that's in meters per second, right? That's, uh, um, that's already divided by the fil filter area. So then we could multiply that by the area of one filter. You can, you can do this one of two ways. You could do that by area of one filter times the number of filters, or you could do it by the area of the filter times the area of, we'll say, all filters. And just capture that in one spot. 
Um, that seems slightly less intuitive to me, so I'm just going to, you know, it's the same thing, right? You just multiply it. So I'm going to keep that away for the moment and just say this is just one filter, the area of one filter. Okay, so this is going to give you, in terms of a, uh, in terms of a relationship, if we're using the effective loading rate, that's effectively the amount of water that a given filter is producing over through its whole cycle time on average. So if you assume that you have the right uh, trade-offs, the right um, system where you're not turning all filters off at one given time, you're rotating it smartly, then then you should be fine. And so then you have this effective loading rate times the area of one filter times the number of filters. This is going to give you um, meters per second times square meters is cubic meters per second, which is your Q. Okay, so this is this would be the uh, I guess the equation we'll use here um, to solve this problem. And this is something that I'm expecting you to be able to intuit for the exam. I mean, you could, you could memorize this relationship, that's fine. But I want you to, I hope you can see where this is coming from and how you could solve that. We're going to do the same thing with membrane filters as well. With fluxes, you need some sort of, we have a flux value, which is effectively the REF here is a flux how much membrane surface area is it going to require or how many membrane modules if they each have this number of this amount of uh, surface area all that okay so that's that's the way I would approach it um, I will give you a moment if you haven't already um, to work on that I'll write up the equation for REF as a reminder here So we already have the volumes from last time, so this is going to be pretty easy. Um, you know the area of the filter, 64 square meters. The total cycle time was 24 hours, 
if you do that conversion, that's 86,400 seconds. And so if we solve. This should be, if you think about it, it should be slightly less than the loading rate, the normal loading rate. So um, that's a, one way to double check here that you're in the right place. And the number I get is 0 0.00527. Um, cubic meters per square meter per second. Okay, which is slightly less than the 0 0.055. Okay, from there we can use this equation. Uh, there's, there's maybe some other ways to think about it. You could also say Q total is gonna be equal to the Q net from one filter, which is really essentially just this right here, times the number of filters. So that's just a, another way to rewrite this here. Um, so. Either way you do it, you're going to end up using this equation. We know we have 2.40 cubic meters per second as the Q total. So we set that, set that up as equal to REF times the area of the filter um, times the number, solve for the number. And the answer you get here um, is 7.12, but we can't deal with just seven filters, right? We and we cannot we cannot round this number down because we have we have to meet the amount of you know the full water needs, right? So um, this turns into eight filters in this specific case because we're we're not going to install just 0.12 of a filter. We're going to install the full filter, most likely, and that way we just have some extra buffer capacity in case the plant needs to meet a little more demand. It's common for water treatment plants to eventually need upgrades to, to meet higher demands as you know the populations they serve increase or whatever. Um, so that's, that's not uncommon anyway. So at this point we would say, okay, this is eight filters. So it's kind of a rare case, but we do need to round up here. Okay, now one thing you, you might note is uh, if you look at this compared to if you had tried to do something with the filter efficiency, if you'd gone the filter efficiency route, you would have gotten um, a number of 6.96 filters. And uh, got my mask in my mouth, um, or a piece of it. Okay, um, if you went the filter efficiency route, which we're not gonna do, I'm gonna say, not this. Um, what we don't want to do is um, calculate it as in the Q total divided by um, the area of the filter and instead of using the the REF there um, inserting this new I drew that wrong um, new times the VA. I told you that was an approximation. If you did that, this gives you some answer that is close, that's 6.96. That leads to you to seven filters, which is the wrong answer, right? So just letting you know that if it is not correct to use that filter efficiency. You got a question?
your order of magnitude is one higher than point, what I've got? Point zero five or point zero zero five. Okay, so that's, um, that's happening because when you take the 5.5 uh, 5 liters per square meter per second, and you, um, you need to convert this to meters instead of liters, so we, when we do that, we multiply by one cubic meter per 1,000 liters. And that, that's that conversion that we need. And that's going to let the liters cancel. And that's going to divide this by, um, by 1,000. So it's really just moving that five, that decimal place, three digits over to the left, right? So one, um, so one there, two, would so it'd be one, two, and then one more would be here. So that's that's where that comes from. And so if if you had uh, when you're solving for the REF, if you um, if it was the same number but you were missing one, I would think it was sourced from here, um, or perhaps you accidentally missed a digit somewhere else that that was able to multiply it by a factor of ten. Um, I'm guessing it's just a decimal place error somewhere. Because the, the effective loading rate should not be higher, let alone 10 times higher than the, the normal loading rates. Um, so I, I think that should be just a um, just, you know, calculator type error there. Okay. Any other questions, comments here? Okay, so last thing I want to talk about for the granular filtration things um, would be a reading assignment. It's an interesting one here, and we'll do one of the participation quiz things on this um, towards the end of our uh, total disinfection, or this second unit. So before the exam, I'll, I'll have a, a quiz on this at some point, so I'll give you a, a couple weeks to read it. Um, it's not going to take you a couple weeks to read it, but I'm just giving you plenty of time uh, to get to it. Um, so I'll t show you here. Um, I, I posted it here. We've got um, this required reading, massive cryptosporidium outbreak in Milwaukee. Uh, this is from 1993, and it was um, it had this uh, this event had several issues. There was um, filtration issues, granule filtration issues that ended up leading to um, a large amount of this cryptosporidium, these spores, so there's a, a resistant pathogen, resists chlorine pretty well, um, and we didn't know a lot about it, uh, but it ended up sickening an estimated 403,000 people, so speaking of uh, epidemics lately. Um, I think it about 70 deaths were attributed to it, which are mostly elderly or HIV uh, compromised people. Um, so this uh, this disease is not it's not terrible for most people. Any worse than a, a month or so of acute watery diarrhea is terrible, um, but it can certainly be very a very big problem for immunocompromised people. Um, so you may have heard of this or Giardia if you're kind of into hiking and like. Drinking, drinking stream water sort of stuff. This is what you'd be mostly, you know, concerned about getting because it would be, I mean, it's pretty common in the environment. A lot of uh, animals, mammals uh, carry it in the wild. So, and it doesn't take very many spores to get you infected. So, anyway, I want you to take a look. Um, you don't have to read every word. That's not my point here. But take a look to really identify what's the, what were the operational failures and what, like what is. What is it that happened? Why did it happen? And operationally speaking, what could have been different? Uh, I think it's an interesting read and an interesting look, especially as we're all kind of attuned to outbreaks lately. This is certainly a waterborne disease outbreak and a failure of um, water treatment. So that's that's posted for you. Um, the quiz will be like you know what you've had already. Um, I'll try to get you one for the granular filtration. Um, uh, before before our next class, um, so I'll probably try to put that up um, 
before the weekend um, give you kind of give you test a little bit of knowledge on the uh, general stuff of granular filtration so that's up um, let's see what else was there I think that might have been it so yeah take a look there um, see what you think let me know if you've got questions um, and I that's about it for today we'll we'll do membrane filtration next time also working on your uh, your uh, homeworks and exams so I'm hoping to get those back to you next week um, and again come back to the very beginning of this uh, video if you want to hear what I had to say about the exam that'll that'll be on there all right so have a good weekend we'll see you next time